Hi, I'm Lucy Mortem. And my name is Ginny. And we invite you to join us every week on Les Mordio, where we discuss our favorite true crime topics. But not just true crime, any and all things dark and mysterious that pertain to the human psyche. Cults, conspiracy, weird pop culture. But hey, we're not professionals and we're often inappropriate. We really bank on you finding that charming, though. (laughs) So turn out the lights, lock the doors, and find us on your favorite podcast app. Welcome to the Vocal Fries Podcast, the podcast about linguistic discrimination. I'm Megan Figueroa. And I'm Carrie Gillen. And today we have two housekeeping items before we start our show. The first is an email from a listener, uh, Liz. You've got mail. Uh, Hi, Fry Ladies. I was listening to episode six, A Serious Problem About AI and Vocal Recognition, and there was a little side comment about court stenographers that I wanted to clear up. The first thing that I wanted to say is that the term stenographer is a little outdated, Think Mad Men era. The profession is generally referred to as reporting in a judicial environment, court reporting. People, <laughs> old white men, who still call the women in, my, in the profession stenographers and have also called them things like scribe or calling women in my parallel profession, madame. And it's just weird and degrading. Out of 40 plus people, I know exactly one court reporter who does voice recognition as her chosen form of reporting. She uses this long tube with a mouthpiece attached and repeats everything everyone is saying back into it. And I just wanted to say, that sounds really interesting. I, I kind of want to see a picture of it. Yes, I, I feel like we should have a picture because I am imagining an elephant. <laughs> <laughs> um, back to the email. Uh, the thing most people don't realize about court proceedings is that reporters will occasionally tell people to slow down. Judges and reporters will both tell people that they're not allowed to speak at the same time, and there's always a digital recording of everything, the unofficial record, the court reporter is the official record. And again, stepping in here, I did know that, but I always forget, because I know there are some cases where the recording is different than the transcription, and there's been some issues around that. Mm -hmm. Um, Anyway, back to the email. Sorry if this was off topic, but I know how bizarre the legal world is, and honestly, most people encounter it at least once in their lives. The more people know, even about basic things like the room they're walking into, the less scary it can be. Thanks for everything you do. You're both amazing. Aw, thanks, Liz. Yes, thank you, Liz. And (laughs) that reminds me that we probably will get to some sort of linguistics and the court system, right? Yes. That's definitely a goal. That's Yeah, that's been a goal for since the beginning, actually. Oh, yeah. I talk about it. Um, so if anybody's interested in talking with us about it, let yeah, us know. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And you don't have to be a linguist. I think I think that's obvious now, right? That, I yeah. Mean, we, we had um, Alberto last week, or last episode. Um, so yeah, we, we like to talk to everyone. Speaking of episodes, this is our second uh, housekeeping item. We are going to start MailChimping. Uh, which means that you can sign up for emails and we won't spam you. The emails that you'll get will be um, about a new episode dropping or something very important like announcing, you know, I don't know, something very important. (laughs) (laughs) When you read it, you'll be like, this is important. This is not spam. So... (laughs) (laughs) Um, We'll tweet about it, uh, Facebook about it when we get that up and running. Um, So, yeah. And now we'll start our episode, which is about Chicano English. Yeah, and uh, we talked a little bit about it. It came up last week with um, Alberto Rios about Chicano identity and um, identifying as Chicano. Um, but this time we're going to be talking about the actual like nitty gritty linguistics about it and what we're judging when we judge it. All right. So we are very excited to have um, Dr. Carmen Fott here with us today. Dr. Fott is a professor of linguistics at Pitzer College. She received um, her BA and MA from Stanford University and her PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. She teaches courses such as languages and language and ethnicity, and language and society. She literally wrote the book on Chicano English uh, called Chicano English in Context. Uh, Welcome, uh, Carmen, and thank you so much for being with us. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. Awesome. So actually, last week, um, we did an episode with um, Chicano poet um, Alberto Rios, and we kind of talked about uh, 
what Chicano is, but um, just for the listeners, wh- how would you define Chicano and what is Chicano English? Well, Chicano is one of the words that people use for people of Latino or Latina ethnicity, Mm -hmm. particularly in the Southwest, Mm -hmm. um, but also in other places across the country. And it's usually used for people whose families are of Mexican-American origin or Mexican origin, uh, if you go back a few generations, but sometimes can include other people from other parts of Central America. And then Chicano English is a variety of English, uh, like if you've ever heard British people speak British English or Australian English, Chicano is another variety of English Mm -hmm. that is spoken um, by a lot of people of Mexican-American origin in different parts of the U.S. So not all the people who are Chicano speak Chicano English, and occasionally you have some people who might have grown up in a Chicano community who aren't Chicano themselves but speak Chicano English, just like anything else. Right. So do you identify as Chicano? Uh, I don't because my ancestors are from Europe. My mother was from Spain. Um, So Mm -hmm. I'm very uh, uh, careful about that because there's some things that I might not be able to talk Mm -hmm. about because they're not my experience. But I grew up in Southern California and the majority of my um, friends and people my family knew growing up were Mm Mexican-American. So I feel like that's a community that is um, part of how I grew up and part of my region where I live. Is Pitts... Is Pitzer in Southern California then? Yes, it is. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We're just outside of LA, like about an an hour or half an hour out from LA. Okay. And the, the, um, in your book, the, um, group of, um, Chicano English speakers you spoke to were LA based, right? Yes, they were. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yes, it's a very important distinction that not all Chicanos speak Chicano English. And another, I think, um, big misconception about it is that Chicano English is just uh, Spanish influenced uh, English. Yes, that's right. That's a mistake. I mean, that's right in the sense that you are right that that is a mistake. Right. <laughs> there's two, there's kind of like, if you want to think about it this way, there's several different ways that people can speak. Mm-hmm. So someone might grow up, uh, uh, let's just take uh, a Latina who grows up in Los Angeles and let's say, um, sometimes, for example, let's say her family is middle class and she just never knew anybody who spoke Chicano English. So she might grow up speaking a variety of English where you, that sounds pretty much how I talk, that just sounds kind of like California, but you can't tell what necessarily her ethnicity is. Then you could have another Latina who grows up as a native speaker of Chicano English here. Everyone she knows speaks Chicano English, and so that's what she learns. And then you could have another Latina who comes comes over from Mexico when she's 20. Now, if she comes over from Mexico when she's 20 and learns English then, she's not going to speak English like a native speaker. And she's not probably going to speak Chicano English. She's going to speak English with the influence from Spanish because it's not her native language. Mm -hmm. But for people who speak Chicano English, Chicano English is their native language. It's the one they grew up with, so they speak it perfectly. It's not a mistake. Mm -hmm. And some of the people who speak Chicano English also speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. And some people who speak Chicano English don't speak any Spanish at all. I mean, only the amount you need to order a burrito at Taco Bell or something. Right, exactly. (laughs) So the amount that I have. Yeah. Yeah. Also, what are you doing at Taco Bell? Let me tell you. So, <laughs> um, so this this reminds me, um, and I would just feel so terrible if I forgot to to shout out um, the movie Selena, <laughs> because there's a part where Edward James almost uh, doesn't want Selena to go to Mexico because her Spanish mm-hmm. isn't quote unquote like good enough, and then he yes. goes on into a rant about how it's so hard to be Mexican American. Because you have to be, you yeah. know, you have to be like more American than Americans and more Mexican than Mexicans. Listen, being Mexican American is tough. Anglo's jump all over you if you don't speak English perfectly. Mexicans jump all over you if you don't speak Spanish perfectly. We got to be twice as perfect as anybody else. <laughs> this reminds me yes. of like the struggle um, for some Chicanos of not speaking Spanish. So even though it's yes. a tru- it's a truism or it's true that they don't speak Spanish, they're 
is some in-group problems with that. Or I don't want to say problems, but um, some tension, right? And it's in your book as well. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, it is. I have an example there from a woman named Veronica who says, my friends tease me. They say I'm not real Mexican because I don't speak Spanish. But I I am. I think I am. And it's true. Of course, you can be Mexican-American and you can have that ethnicity and you can be proud of who you are and where you came Mm -hmm. from without speaking Spanish. And you know what else? It's not their fault. It's not that these kids don't speak Spanish because they're lazy. Do you know why they don't speak Spanish? Because a lot of their parents don't teach them Spanish. And do you know why they don't teach them Spanish? Because our society is very negative about Spanish and it doesn't treat it as a good thing. Teachers in the school will say, well, maybe he's not doing well because you speak Spanish to him at home, which is totally ridiculous. Linguists linguists get so upset when we hear this because all over the world, in Switzerland, in Africa, kids grow up speaking three languages and it's no big deal. It's only in America where we act like there's something wrong with speaking two languages. But because teachers and other people are putting that negative vibe about it out there, the parents are like, well, I don't want anything bad to happen to my kid. I guess I won't teach them Spanish. And that's why they don't speak Spanish. But but we should change it because being bilingual is a value and is something that's good for us as a society and a community and in the world in a global economy. So we should change that attitude so that people do feel good to teach their children Spanish. Yeah, and it's a really good language to travel with. Just think of all the countries you can use it in. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, that's definitely still a sentiment um, that I see in schools. I work with kids and you think... Some people, I, when I tell them that, no, there are teachers that don't want Spanish spoken in the home or, or suggest that you should speak English in the home so the kids will, um, you know, be be better at reading, et cetera. They don't believe me, but it's definitely still happening. Um, yeah, well, yeah, that's true. And that's very, very bad because we have science right. about this. We have linguistic science and research. One of the things that has happened recently is that there's been research showing that being bilingual helps you delay the onset of Alzheimer's mm-hmm. and can protect your brain. Don't you want to protect your kids' brains? So these <laughs> yeah. teachers need to get, you know, they need to get good information from scientists before they start giving advice about stuff they don't know anything right. about. Right. It makes me very yes, angry. Yes, definitely angry. It makes me so angry. <laughs> well, I had the, um, the, same, the same thing happened to me. I don't speak Spanish, even though my dad does, but he was literally whipped for it in school. So he thought uh, Spanish equals bad, right? So your kid's going to get in trouble if they speak right. Spanish. Right. So there's like a whole generation of Chicanas like me who don't speak uh, Spanish because of that. I mean, our parents were right. physically hurt. For speaking it. Right. It's so sad. It's so sad. And we should we should address that. We should talk about it openly. And we mm-hmm. should have, you know, we should have pride in, in, in where we came from. And if that includes another home language, you should be able to speak that language with pride. And no one should ever feel like they'd be punished for speaking the language of their ancestors. I think that's right. very sad and very wrong. And we'd be a stronger country if we didn't have that attitude. And we loved and embraced all the languages that are spoken here. Yeah, definitely. Um, you actually uh, say at the end of your book that you hope that uh, linguists and sociolinguists actually do better about reaching out and sharing our science. Do you think that we've come yes. a long way since your book came out in 2004 or 2003, right? I think I'm going to say we've come away. I don't know if it's a long <laughs> way, but we've definitely come away. There are a lot of people like Jeff Reeser and a lot of the people at North Carolina State University who've really put a lot of effort into getting linguistics into the education curriculum mm-hmm. so people can learn about dialects and kids can learn about their own dialects and their own different languages that they speak and value them. So I think there's some really good work going on. There's good documentaries that they're doing too. There's one called Spanish Voices that just talks about all the different ways that you can be Latino in North Carolina where they are, which is really interesting. All the different language varieties and why they're good. And it's, it's, so we're making some progress, but we could still stand to make more. I'm always pushing for Mm -hmm. more. One of the reasons that I like to do interviews on the radio in different places is because I want as many people as possible who aren't linguists to hear this information and know it. Yes. That's exactly why we started this podcast, actually, because there's so much disinformation about language out there. And it's really upsetting to me. Mm -hmm. That's why we're here. Yeah, exactly. Yay. So we already talked about vocal fry when it comes to women, but uh, we touched on the fact that it's uh, sometimes used in Chicano English. Do you have anything to add to that conversation? 
Well, I haven't really looked at vocal fry in Chicano English, but it makes sense because there's a lot of vocal fry in California, and Chicano English is in California, and that's kind of where one of its main yeah. bases. But I could definitely go through some of the features for yeah. you. Um, I, I think the most important thing to remember is that, first of all, everybody who speaks a language speaks a dialect of that mm -hmm. language. So you speak a dialect, I speak a dialect. A dialect is not a bad mm -hmm. thing. It's it's something you can't help. It's like the make and model of a car. Mm -hmm. Like you have a Honda, but then it has to have a model, like a Civic or an Accord. You can't just say, oh, no, 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 I just have a Honda. It doesn't have a model. It's the same thing. You can't say, I speak a language. I don't speak right. a dialect. No, everyone speaks a dialect. And Chicano English is just one particular dialect. So it has features just like any other mm -hmm dialect like like I said like British English Australian English it had features at all the different levels so it has features in the sound system so for example you might hear um, um, instead of them you might hear dem for mm -hmm. them the duh at the beginning that's that's a feature that's very common in a lot of dialects because a lot of um, a lot of languages don't have the it's kind of a weird sound that we have mm -hmm. in English and then you might hear things with the vowels uh, for example in the ending ing on words like coming and going Chicano English you might hear coming going with that e sound in there that's very typical for Chicano English um, then in the uh, in the um, the, the, the system of the grammar you might hear multiple negation mm -hmm. which is like he didn't say nothing to nobody or something like that again that's a feature that's common to other varieties mm -hmm. but it also occurs in Chicano English and then in the in the system of the lexicon the words you have uh, words like barely mm -hmm. the word barely which means something just happened recently so I barely broke my leg like in my dialect I don't say that I don't say I barely broke my leg but in Chicano English you can say I barely broke my leg which means I broke my leg really recently right. okay so in every area there are some things that are a little bit different in in Chicano English and those things have rules right that's one of the things people don't understand so something like multiple negation well I didn't do nothing to nobody that's not only common to other dialects but it's also common to other languages that's the way that you do negation in Spanish and in French and in all these all these languages you do it that way um, uh, the mainstream varieties of English don't do multiple negation but Chicano English and other varieties mm -hmm. do so and again it's governed by rules it's not a bunch of mistakes it's a pattern if it was mistakes everybody would do it a different way and everybody would use different things and who knows what they would do and that's kind of what happens with non-native speakers when someone comes over and learns English they make all sorts of mistakes and the mistakes aren't the same for each person but in Chicano English the things that people think of as mistakes are the same for each person because they're not mistakes they're a pattern governed by rules just like all the things that happen in linguistics so one of the features or lexical items that I saw you talk about uh, was the word fool used a little bit differently. Oh, yes. Yes. That's kind of a funny one because that's not really Chicano English. It is, but it's like slang, you know, that was that was used among. So here's the other thing to remember. Chicano English is spoken by a lot of people who have a lot of different identities. Mm -hmm. Some are men, some are women, some are older people, some are younger people. So all those things are going to affect it too. Language is can show our ethnicity but it's not just about our ethnicity it's about who we are as a person so the kids I was interviewing used fool because they were young mm -hmm. young guys and that was something that they used but an older Chicano speaker let's say a Latina who's an older woman probably mm -hmm. wouldn't use that term so just like anything else Chicano English has variation within it just like I don't sound the same as someone from New York or I might not use the same vocabulary items as someone from Montana you know some one person who uses Chicano English who's like young and lives in California might be different from someone who's older and lives in Texas. Right. So can you explain how these younger speakers were using fool? Oh, it was just like guy mm -hmm. kind of, you know, um, fool, you can't go there, you know, or dude, like dude, okay. exactly yeah. like dude. There you go. And just like dude, it I probably started out being something you could only use with mm -hmm. guys, but then it started to be like something you could use with everyone. And every once in a while they used it with me and then I felt like, oh, okay, they yeah, you've, accept me. You've made it. <laughs> yeah. What about um, use of Spanish? Even if the Chicano English speaker is someone who does not speak Spanish, are there um, Spanish words thrown in as a feature of Chicano English? 
Absolutely, there can be. I think of that as emblematic use of Spanish. That's mm-hmm. the term that you'd normally use for it. And that's really important that even if you don't speak Spanish, if you throw in a word in Spanish like my madrina or my quinceañera or, you know, or mm-hmm. mic tamales and you can pronounce it properly and everything, <laughs> that's an, a symbolic way of showing, you know, this is my ethnicity and this is my identity. And I identify with Spanish. It's not my fault that my parents didn't teach me Spanish. Right. You know, I, I still feel it. I feel right. it as part of my identity. And I think that's important. You'll even hear, for example, newscasters on TV mm-hmm. who are Latino or Latina who are saying a sentence in English and a word will come up like Latina and they'll say it the right way with the t and everything, not Latina like we would say it in English. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that can be very important. There are, of course, um, also Mexican-American speakers who do speak Spanish. And, right. and so, you know, it's not everybody – there are young people who do speak speak Spanish. So there's there's a little bit of everything in the community. Right. And that and that's going to be different from what what people might know as Spanglish, right? Correct. Spanglish is its own thing. So linguists have found that everywhere in the world where people speak two or more languages on a regular basis in a community, those languages will eventually start being mixed together. Mm-hmm. It, you know, it can happen with Chinese. It can happen with any any two languages that you have, with French and English, franglais in places where people <laughs> speak French and English. And, yeah, and my so, sister speaks franglais. <laughs> well, there you go. See? So it's very, it's actually very, very common as a phenomenon. And Spanglish is just, we, we we call it code switching. That's the technical term. Mm-hmm. And Spanglish is just the variety of code switching that you get, you know, in, in Mexican American communities where there's a, there's a lot of English and Spanish. And just like with the other things we've talked about, there's a lot of misconceptions about mm-hmm. it. So the first misconception is that that's people who don't speak either language well. Oh, they don't know yeah. English and they don't know Spanish, so they're just putting in a little bit. Right. Think about it for a minute. Just think for one second. Mm -hmm. Maybe you know a couple words of Italian. Can you code switch between English and Italian? I mean, think how silly that would sound. You'd be like, hi, I'm going to the the linguini with the (laughs) stracciatelli pasta alla pomodoro you know you don't know enough words to really switch back and forth so you have to know both languages in order to switch so spanglish is really only done spanglish would not commonly be done by the people we were talking about who never learned spanish Mm -hmm. spanglish can only be done by people who are bilingual and it's different from chicano english chicano english can be spoken by someone who doesn't know any spanish at all Mm -hmm. to speak spanglish you have to know spanish and english and when you talked about code switching, another way to code switch would be between, say, Chicano English and the quote unquote mainstream English, right? Yes, you could do that too. I don't, yeah, I guess it's possible. I think what tends to happen in that situation is more that people choose different varieties for different situations. Okay. Yep. So the same person, that's another thing to remember. People would hear someone speaking in Chicano English be like, oh, they don't know how to talk good English because there's this prejudice. They don't know how to talk good English. Well, first of all, it's not bad English. It's a different variety. But second of all, even if they're speaking a different variety, that doesn't mean they don't know the mainstream variety. They could know that one too. Mm-hmm. And like you said, they could switch back and forth. So it's totally common that someone who is a Chicano English speaker might speak hang out speaking Chicano English with their friends when they're relaxed and having a good time and then they go to a job interview and they switch to mainstream English because they know that that's the one the interviewer expects to hear so that's right. another thing we all switch right it doesn't matter yeah. whether you speak Chicano yeah. English or we also we don't talk the same with our friends when we're on a Friday night having a beer as we do if we're in a professional interview yeah. um, and and so it's it's kind of the same thing it's just that in a in Latino communities you might have more resources when you're relaxed you might switch to chicano english you might switch to spanglish or you might switch to spanish there's just a lot of resources linguistically in the community which is beautiful <laughs> yes it is yes yeah. it is that's certainly how linguists feel i got to write a whole book about it because yeah. there were so many resources that's how special it is and and instead you know it's just like we said too bad that in our society instead of really valuing and uplifting that people are suspicious and and think there's something wrong and negative about it we need to change that i'm going to keep working at it at least and we will too so what is it what why are people still suspicious of it what are we judging when we're judging speakers of chicano english Well, when we judge a variety that a group of people speaks as being bad English, really what we're doing is we're judging that group of people. Right. Yep. That's what happens. Language. You guys are like, yeah, mm-hmm. we know. 
Uh, yeah, it's true. I'm it's happy true. to hear another person say it, though. Yes, yes. please. Yes. No, Preach. it's true. <laughs> it's true. That's it's that's what it is, you know. And if a group of people is at a low socioeconomic level, the way they speak will be judged. Mm-hmm. If a if a group of people is from an ethnicity like African American or Latino that's been historically um, um, prejudiced against by racism in this country over a long history, then their way of speaking will be judged negatively. That's Mm -hmm. what it is. You know, British people and the variety that they speak sounds very different to us. Sometimes we don't even understand them. Oh, they said Mm -hmm. lorry for truck. They said, they Mm -hmm. say, um, um, pants for underpants. So if you go and say, "Oh, I don't know whether to wear a skirt or pants," they think that's very funny, right? <laughs> and when you when you hear them talk, they don't have R's; they drop their R's. Right. They say "car" instead of "car." But instead of criticizing that, which we could, and saying, "Oh, look how lazy they are," they drop their R. Everything we don't criticize <laughs> that. Sure. We don't say, "Oh, that sounds funny to say, Lori." That's not the right word. We don't criticize any of that. They have grammar differences. They say, "I didn't go to the store, but I could have done." You know, we don't say. That in American English but we don't say that's wrong to add the done no we're like oh they're British it sounds so good because right. we respect that group of people and we think that accent sounds good and they're they're white and you know there's a lot of things about that that cause them to be okay if someone speaks with a French accent oh that sounds so romantic you know but <clears throat> but when we're prejudiced against a group of people, then we're prejudiced against their way of speaking. And if you look around the country, that's what happens. Southern accents, because the South has a long history of being seen as a place where people are poor and they're not very educated and all that kind of stuff. Whether any of that stuff is true or not, that's the ideology. That's the idea that people have. And so they're prejudiced against that way of speaking. And that's why there's been so much trouble. Same with Spanish. Do you think kids ever would get yelled at for speaking French in a classroom? No. You think if no. two little kids come from France that are twins and are in the classroom and they're speaking French. You think the teacher's going to punish them? No, because we think France is so beautiful, the Eiffel Tower and Mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. French people are so romantic. It's it's exactly the same thing as the kids speaking Spanish, but it's about a social prejudice. It's not about the language. Right. Right. Absolutely. And another thing that comes into this, did the law ever get changed, Megan? There was a law in the books that was barring teachers with accents. And that's how it was worded, too, uh, with mm. accents, which we've already oh. talked about. Everyone has an accent. Yeah. So basically, they barred they barred all teachers. That's unfortunate. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> yeah, we don't I wish I could have been there as a linguist to say, you know, you're going to have a small problem with that. It's going to really reduce the pool by a lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's true. And really what they meant was Mexican accents. <laughs> Yes, that's it. That's exactly what they meant. Yep. Do you think they're really going to exclude a teacher with a French accent? No. no. It's A lot of this stuff is just a thinly veiled way of doing racism and prejudice. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just we hide behind, well, not we, because I try not to do it, but right. we, people are hiding behind the idea that somehow it's okay with language. Like you can't fire someone from a job because they're black, but you can fire them because right. of the language they speak. Yep. And that's not okay. It's really the same thing, just pushed to a different level it's a sneaky way of being racist yeah, or just like, not so sneaky way yeah like, well english only i i mean english is the official language of california i think it is in arizona as well yes. and um that's the same thing making right. english the official language is is it sounds okay to people they're like well yeah yeah i guess english should be official even people who have you know very reasonable beliefs and aren't you know horrible yeah. people they they think it sounds okay but really the only purpose of making english the official language anywhere is to discriminate against other languages that's really the only purpose it doesn't serve any purpose and i had a debate that i can send you the link to if you want with yeah. this guy mario mujico who is the mario mujica is the was at the time the director of english only of u.s english the the, uh, yeah. the national group yeah and we had this debate and he said you know we just think everyone should speak English and I said linguists would totally agree that it's of benefit to people in this country to speak English and if your group wants to put a lot of money into setting up centers where people can learn English we'd totally be in favor of that Mm -hmm. but that's not where the money is going it's going to make a law that you can only speak English and that's not the same thing and that doesn't teach a single person English all it does is discriminate against people who speak other languages and um and, and it's true. It's true. There's no reason to make English 
the official language. Do you think someone who comes here as an immigrant and is working three jobs and is not learning English because they're too busy is going to sit there and go, oh, I just realized English is the official language of Arizona, right. so I'm going to just quit one of my jobs and go learn English. No, that's not how it works. Right. That's not how it works at all. People aren't resistant to learning English. So that, that, that law doesn't help with that problem or with that situation at all. It doesn't provide any opportunities. It doesn't help people learn English. All it does is make it easier to send those two kids to the principal's office because they were speaking Spanish in class. And I don't think that's something we want to encourage. Right. No, absolutely not. And would you say some of the phonological features of Chicano English um, would make, say, like a non-linguist perhaps think that um, it's an it's accented speech, so-called accented speech? Yes. Right. That's that's exactly right. Yeah, that's a very good observation on your part. In fact, I have a, I had a situation here where um, a lady in in one of the offices who was an administrative assistant said, "How come the Mexican kids don't seem to learn English? Like the Chinese kids learn English and they all speak English, but like Jose, who works in my office, just seems like he never completely learned it." And I knew the kid she was talking about. He spoke Chicano English, but he didn't know any Spanish. So she thought he was speaking a variety that was influenced by Spanish, but in fact, he was speaking a native variety. People just don't know. And it can be hard to tell. Like, if you aren't a linguist, it can be hard to tell the difference because Chicano English does have a lot of sounds that are individually influenced by Spanish. But that's just historically in the community. That doesn't mean an individual speaks Spanish. And again, it's a completely native variety with its own rules and everything. It's, it's exactly like speaking... Australian English like if someone comes over from Australia and you say wow they didn't learn English well you know because their sounds are so different but in fact they did learn English perfectly they just learned a different type from you yeah and this is very similar to the situation with the res English that we talked about a few episodes ago most oh, people yeah. speak res English that's their native language but there are influences from yeah. indigenous languages from all over the place in that variety but especially the local indigenous languages and they'll have an effect on that particular individual, yes. but it's not direct. It's a very indirect connection. Right. Right. I wish it were direct because then it would mean that more yes. people spoke the native language. Yes, and we're exactly. losing Native American languages every day. It's very sad. I wish, exactly. you know, a lot of linguists are working hard to preserve Native American languages, but there's so many of them. And, you know, talk about the kind of prejudice in society. I mean, putting right. all the kids in a boarding school and punishing them if they spoke yeah. any of their languages, that wiped out a lot of languages. It was very, very sad. Mm -hmm. And I hope we never do that again. And that's yeah. why I'm fighting against U.S. English and all that stuff because it's, it's part of the same legacy and I don't want that for us I want us to have I think it will strengthen us as a country well I know it would strengthen us as a country to have a, a big respect for different languages and varieties it would make it would make us a better player on a global stage it would make uh, our our lives easier it would make people's pride in their heritage something that you support rather right. than something that creates a battle so it's it's you know we could still certainly make a lot of progress on that, and I hope that we will. Yeah, we're fighting a lot of, uh, I guess it's like intersectional uh, discrimination here when it comes to Chicano English because of just the political climate as well. The whole Mexicans are rapists or criminals kind of thing. That, yes. that is going to reinforce any sort of discrimi like discriminatory yes, views of the, of the dialect, right? Well, yes, this is true. And these things do tend to go in, in, um, in groups of things that all come together. Either you're moving the country forward and you are, you know, trying to make things better, give people more rights, give people more access to things, or you're trying to move it backwards and restrict people and take away their access to things. Mm -hmm. And the same people have prejudices about language, have prejudices about different ethnic groups, um, have prejudices about women and mm -hmm. will treat women in a way that's not respectful and think it's okay, you know, all the stuff that we've been hearing in the press mm -hmm. about the way that some of these big figures have 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 assaulted and treated women badly. I mean, there's all these things go together. And, um, you know, I would like us to see to 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 be making those things better instead of worse. Yeah. Me yes. too. <laughs> so, <laughs> hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah. Um, so what would be the ideal situation? So we heard about Jose and the uh, the office worker. What yeah. what would you want the office worker to say when they hear someone like Jose? Like, 
What is the ideal? I would, here's what it would be ideal for me. I would like them to say, well, you know, when I was in high school, I took a class on linguistics. So <laughs> yes. when Jose was first speaking, I thought maybe he speaks Spanish and that's an accent. But as I was listening to him, I realized his English is very fluent. And then I realized, oh, no, he doesn't speak a non-native variety. He may not even speak Spanish. He just speaks a variety of English that's different from my variety. And that's okay. Right. And I'm not going to judge anything about him. I'll judge him on whether he's a good speaker or not based on whether he explains things clearly, right. whether he listens when I give him directions. That's how I'll decide if he's a good office worker. But right. I won't judge him based on the phonology and the sound system of the variety he speaks any more than I would someone from France or Australia. That's what I would like them to say. Well said. Yes. <laughs> yes. So that's where we need to get to, everyone. <laughs> yeah, that would be the goal. And even little kids, you know, we think, oh, well, this is too complicated for little kids. No. I don't think so. Their little minds are open. They love languages. Mm -hmm. They love to learn words in other languages. And that's the thing that we have on our side is people are very interested in language. Mm -hmm. It's a fun topic. You know, you start asking people, in your part of the country, do you say soda or pop? Right. And people get into a big thing about it, get all excited and yeah. everything. And, um, and I think we can use that excitement and that interest to help people we could teach you know there, some of my students have done research projects like this where they would play a little clip of someone speaking Chicano English and in one setting they would give them an explanation linguistically of what Chicano English is first and then the other one they wouldn't and people were less prejudiced when they learned about it wow. it was true and teaching them the rules of something let's say African American English that's another variety we I teach my students the rules I make them learn the rules and sometimes they're hard and they struggle and they do bad on the midterm and they're up all night studying mm -hmm. and I think that's good I want them to suffer a little bit because that way when people when they're out in the world and people are saying oh that's just a bunch of slang and bad grammar they can say well you can think what you want but I had to stay up all night studying it right. so I wouldn't fail my exam so it must not be just bad grammar it must right. be some rules there so yeah so that's my goal is to people particularly to have people understand the rules and to capitalize on people's natural interest in languages which I think is very strong mm -hmm. you know and have people enjoy and 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 bring that out and especially in young kids so that by the time they get to be adults if they hear someone saying well you shouldn't speak Spanish at home and they're a teacher they can be like that's absolutely ridiculous and then they go right to the superintendent and say Mrs. Brown was saying that yeah. it's dangerous to speak Spanish. That is not true. In fact, to me, it's the attitude that's dangerous. Yes. Mrs. Brown is dangerous, not the Spanish language. The Spanish language is not dangerous. It's people with prejudices that are dangerous. So down with prejudice. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is, I think you've hit on all of the myths that we, we, we wrote down some things, but you've, uh, you've, you've hit them all. I think, um, what do you think the the takeaway um, for our listeners who are? I mean, there's a lot of linguists that listen to us, but there are non linguists. Yeah, and we actually, you know, are hoping to get to the non linguists because, um, for the most part, we hope linguists know these type of things. Like, don't judge yes. people for how they speak. Um, but yeah. what do you think the big takeaway is about uh, Chicano English? Um, if you could, if you could sum well, up, you know, your entire book, maybe in one. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. No, I think what I would say is maybe there's like a takeaway for the linguists and a takeaway for the non-linguists. Okay. I think the takeaway for the linguists is we have lots of opportunities. We can go out there and talk to people and not just on the radio or whatever. I mean, when I'm with my friends, you know, a lot of my friends aren't linguists. And if they're like, oh, why do people speak this way? I always try to take the opportunity to explain it so they'll know that little bit mm -hmm. and, um, and, and, and we can work on that. We can work on, you know, the media and, and places so we can get this information out more. For the non-linguists, just try and keep that example in your head that everybody speaks a dialect. And we don't judge the way people from Australia speak. We don't see it as wrong, even though it's different. We should extend that same courtesy to our neighbors here who may speak a different variety. But it's not wrong. It's not bad. It's part of their heritage. And for Chicano English speakers, just remember, this is your heritage. This is part of your heritage. You have a right to it. You have a right to speak Chicano English. You have a right to speak Spanish if you speak Spanish. You have a right to speak Spanglish. It mm -hmm. might be a funny word or whatever, but all these linguistic varieties are part of your ethnic heritage. You, you 
own and deserve them, just like you're, you deserve to eat tamales at Christmas or whatever. Mm-hmm. You deserve all of that as part of your culture. Don't let anyone take it away from you. Don't let anyone tell you that it's wrong. You go ahead and defend it because it belongs to you. There's nothing wrong with it. Linguists and scientists are on your side, yes. and eventually, hopefully, the other people will get on board. But, oh. you know. We'll keep our fingers crossed. You gave you gave me chills. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that was great. Oh. I love what I do, and I thank you for giving me a chance to talk to you about it. Oh no, thank you. <laughs> You're like uh, uh, when we knew we would do Chicano English, of course, and I was like, well, dream guest, uh, Doctor <laughs> Doctor <Bot." laughs> So oh, so thank you so, so much. No, it's been my great pleasure. And you guys are doing your little part. Yes. You, know, you guys there in your corner are doing not even that little, doing your part to get this information out. Yes. So I'm grateful to you. The stuff that I'm complaining about, you're trying to fix it. So yes. my respect. You guys are my heroes. Thank <laughs> my you. Wonder women. Thank, you. Well, thank you. Yeah. And we, uh, we always end each episode with our tagline, which is don't be an asshole. <laughs> Do not be an asshole. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right. Oh, so thank goodness. you. Thank you guys Bye. so much. Bye. Oh, yeah. Bye. (laughs) Bye. (laughs) Bye. (laughs) The Vocal Fries podcast is produced by Chris Ayers for Halftone Audio. Theme music by Nick Granham. You can find us on Tumblr, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Vocal Fries Pod. You can email us at vocalfriespod at gmail.com.